your voice is very loud. <laughs> All right. So, anything we should know before we get started on everything? Uh, um, you know, I, I've never said this before, but feel free to interrupt if something doesn't make sense, or like you want to follow, like a sort of a more a better explanation of something. Because sure. I'm, you know, I've been doing interviews for thirty years, and in some sometimes. Half the people I talk to are, like, very shy, mm-hmm. so I tend to just, like, rattle on to try <laughs> to keep the ball rolling. And I've developed, like, really weird habits as, like, as an interview subject, like, that are, you know, part of it is trying to try, trying to just be nice. Yeah. But also part of it is, like, trying to, you know, make something happen. But, like, I'm completely excited by the idea of having an actual conversation rather than just like sort of filibustering yeah. which is something that I, I kind of accidentally tend to do so That's anyway okay. yeah so actually honestly when you called me yesterday and you're like hi this is john from the Ant giants you like sounded so fluent with that like this guy's done this eight billion times i genuinely thought it was like a recording for a little bit <laughs> even like a robo call like yeah hey <laughs> have, have, you, have you received a, a, one of these modern robocalls where it, it starts with this weird conversational lady going like, oh, hi, you're hard to reach to my husband. <laughs> well, listen, I'm a robot. It, you know, it's a very weird uh, new thing. But, um, yeah, I have done a lot of interviews. It's true. I actually did this, just uh, as an aside, I did this interview with this guy who was a really odd writer i mean he's more of a I, th- I think he sort of wants to be a book writer but he's writing for the av club i think oh cool and he and he did it he did a he did a interview with me about being in inter- like this was like five years ago or something and he was like you know john flensburg has been interviewed for 25 years and he's and like i'm going to interview him about being interviewed the local and man it, gets interviewed Yes, exactly. Local man gets interviewed, and it's it's a really interesting. I mean, it was like a really good idea for an interview because, uh-huh. like, he really it really went like granular on all the weird things about how things have changed over time. Like now, there's this whole kind of. Uh, we might as well be recording. I hope you're recording. Oh, I am. You're, <laughs> yeah, you're good. Yeah. Hey, you should put you should put it on the, this on, this in, on the, in the thing. Okay, um, done. There's 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 this. Uh, there's this thing that they, that happens now, and and this happens even this happens from like college papers all the way up to like the most respected journalistic outlets in the world, where you will get like a list of ten questions, and they want you to write your answers in the form as if you are answering in the spoken word. Okay. And like, if it's not like in, if it's if it's not written with enough informality, they'll actually send it back to the publicist and ask you to like change it up. You sound to, too formal. Stop. To to make it <laughs> less like you're typing it. But the thing is, you're typing it. Yeah. You know, you so can't it's stop like this that. crazy, crazy uh, informal, like imposed informality on something that is absolutely artificial. It's the fakest. <laughs> uh, experience you can have in your life, and like you're just. And part of it is like, this is this is just this is you know I'm writing a le- I'm writing a formal letter to a formal question, yeah. And you know from a very prestigious place, and they're asking me to basically be more of a schlub than I am as a, as a person. I mean, one of these one of the outlets that I speak of uh, a certain. A certain lady who dresses in gray actually uh, got in tr- got in, had sort of got into a little bit of trouble where they they basically rewrote something by somebody else uh, who is like a you know a, a bigger star mm-hmm. uh, to put it into this um, casual casual speak and in fact kind of misrepresented them in like a a pretty basic way and then it was the whole thing was revealed and it's such a non-journalistic practice you know well yeah Yeah. if you ask someone to like talk in a well if you if you're correcting someone on like the way they talk and then they submit it and then you give it back and say no you didn't talk right then what are you doing Uh, it's it's all very curious but you know there's there's this other thing where it's like as like the tide recedes from uh you know just 
journalism in general, like, you know, as these newspapers and magazines have no less and less money, mm-hmm. they really rely on people in the creative community to basically, you know, insert their, you know, uh, you know fully formed press release like materials as if it's, you know, uh, just um, as if it's journalism or as if it's, it, it, it's a very artificial time. Yeah. But, in, but anyway, so, so what, so what are the, uh, what, are, what is, tell me who I'm talking to and like, what is this, what is this radio station? All right. So my name is Jack. The show's name is Phonos, spelled P-H-O-N-O-S. And like the Greek? Sure. <laughs> I just got, I got right. Phono and threw an S on it. Oh, okay. <laughs> and but it, but it's not it's 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 phono phonos like not phonos. Yeah. Phonos, not plural is, phonos. Right. Interesting. <laughs> and this is on WTHS eighty nine point nine here in Holland, Michigan. Excellent. What's Holland, Michigan like? Um, it's a small little Dutch community actually, and Hope College is like a school of like, I'd say three thousand people. Uh huh. Is it like like how far away from like uh, is it like Rust Belty? Uh, not really. It's like forty five minutes from Grand Rapids. Oh, okay. So like, if I I could walk to Lake Michigan, it would take me like fifteen minutes. Oh, which is neat. But we also get like lake effect snow, and that's genuinely the worst thing ever. Right. Right. Are you getting it now? <laughs> uh, we got a little bit yesterday. So when you're talking uh, about it, it reminded me of, like, we were probably going to get a big snowstorm. And it started snowing yesterday, but it all melted. But we'll right. probably get slapped here in, like, the next week or two. Yeah, we once were, we once did a show in, what is the place called, uh, that's above, it's in Michigan, but it's above, above like, the actual, uh, uh. Oh, the Upper Peninsula? The upper, we, yeah, yeah, we were booked to do a show in the Upper Peninsula, <laughs> which, like, as someone on our road crew very snarkily said, we're going to the the, the part of the United States they forgot to call Canada. <laughs> Essentially, um, yeah. Uh, but the, the thing that was weird is it was a total crucible getting there. Like, um, we, it, it, it took it was it was like a, a day of travel to get there that was it was like a. 14 hours of travel to get there mm-hmm. and um, and just flying and then flying a littler plane. Was it from New like, York to UP? Yeah, yeah like flying, you know, it was like, you know, like a weird, like, you know, two-step plane thing to oh, get yeah. to another little plane oh, to yeah. take us, which <laughs> seemed like, like then we're on the little plane and it's like when you're in a band and you're on a really little plane, like you're only thinking about one thing the whole time, <laughs> you know, and it's like, it's like, Oh, this snow is really bad, but it's okay because we're in a really little plane, you know. <laughs> so it's just like, okay, this is horrifying. <laughs> and then, and, and Buddy Holly or something. Yeah, ab- absolutely. <laughs> and then, and then we landed, and then uh, we had to drive in a van. And this, you know, we're talking like there's a, like probably ten or eleven of us, mm-hmm. and we're in like you know some like Ford Astro minivan driving. For an hour and a half, through you know, on roads that have just been completely filled with snow. Yeah, and we're all just you know, like our everybody's got their shoulders up around their ears, just you know, <laughs> thinking like this. You know, we're all squeezed together in this thing, and it's so profoundly uncomfortable. And you're just thinking like, I'm a full grown adult. <laughs> like, I, like this is. You know, lots of people have like difficult jobs, but this it, it doesn't have to be like this. No, for real. You know, and and then we get there and we do the show, and then the next day it snows so hard that we can't leave. Oh, God. So we're just stuck in this. We're stuck in this um, like hotel mm-hmm. sort of shine, shining style for like another couple of days. And and you know and and of course you know the truth is it's like. You know, John and I are the founding members of the band. It's our business. Yeah. Everybody else is like on our payroll. Yeah. When we when we do a like a, a one off that turns into a six day run, <laughs> no. Like we we like we basically you know we pay we're paying like thousands of dollars a day to basically just have everybody hate us. Yeah. You know, like everybody's mad at us. Everyone's wondering like why we're doing the show. Like I'm wondering why we're doing the show. Like yeah. I didn't even know. You know, I was like. Why didn't anyone warn us that this was going to be? 
And and what was funny is that it happened so often up there mm-hmm. that, oh, God, that yeah. you know it's basically just like a snow. But everyone who was at our show was like, we thought it was really weird you were coming now because. <laughs> You know, was it it, like there's December no, or something. Yeah, yeah. Like Ugh. basically coming in like <laughs> the worst time of the year, and uh, you know, it was, just, it was just like a terrible mistake. I so like I'm originally from St. Louis, Missouri. So even moving from St. Louis to just Michigan was enough of a culture shock for me. Because like it snows in Missouri, right. but like my first year up here, I was like. I was talking with my roommate's mom. She was, she was like, oh, you're ready for winter? And I was like, yeah, we have winters in Missouri. She was like, oh, you haven't had winter. I was like, oh, God. <laughs> right, right. Well, lake, the lake affects snow. I know people who live in Buffalo, and, like, they have, they have like, lake effect type yeah. reality. And it is it's sort of beyond belief how, how bad it can get, you mm-hmm. know. We actually just did our very first tour, you know, after 30 years of, like, touring across the United States every other year, like, for the entire time. We finally did an actual tour across Canada, like a couple of months ago. Yeah, so. a month ago. And um, I have to say, what was what was crazy about it is like they really spaced out their cities. Man. <laughs> I mean, like, they, and and you wonder why they some in some cases like why they even have cities in. I guess it was related to the railroads, but like mm-hmm. you know, it it is it is a highly inhospitable. You know, Western Canada is is. It is a tough place to be. Oh yeah, for, for sure. sure. You know, for sure. All right, no. not to change subjects or anything. We could talk about weather all day. No, no, no. We're <laughs> moving on to the hard hitting question. Hard hitting journalism question. So yes, this is a pre record. But for those of you who are tuning in on Monday around nine, uh, I am. This is Phonos. My name's Jack, and I'm here with John Flansburg of They Might Be Giants tonight. Yep. And we're going to be talking. So the first thing we're going to talk about is just all the They Might Be Giants happenings. Uh, you guys have a lot of stuff going on right now. Uh, most notably, I Like Fun just came out. And yep. Dial-A-Song is back on the radio waves and YouTube waves and phone waves. And uh, Instant Fan Club is also happening. Yeah, although the Instant Fan Club is now, it's the membership is closed. Yeah. So that's kind of, the Periscope is going down on that. But, um, you know, 2018 is a big, like, uh, you know, it, it's it's a... It's a big work year for us. So basically, we starting in, you know, probably the middle of 2016 or near the the fall of 2016, we started working in earnest on what would be "I Like Fun" and all the accompanying songs that would be featured on Dial a Song. I think it's, it's it's sort of a hard process to explain because it's so sprawling, but basically. Yeah. We don't, our intention is if we're going to do a dial song project year where we're releasing a song every week, um, we don't want to just be, like, I'm friends with Jonathan Colton, and he had a thing, like, in, like, 2006 called Song a Week. Where oh, yeah. He, yeah, that was he awesome. Po- he, yeah, he posted a song every week. And the way he did it is he just, like, sat at home and recorded a song every week, you know, like, which, like, is kind of what you would think you would do. Um, but the thing that was, like, nerve-wracking for, I mean, I, this is part of it, it's, like, just by temperament. Like, I think John and I are both kind of uptight about, like, the quality of what we're doing and, mm-hmm. and don't want to get kind of caught out, like, not having anything finished. Yeah. We don't know how long anything is going to take to finish. And that sort of folded in with the quality that people expect. You know, like, you can't have a demo service. these. There's no, there's no, there's no demo level anymore in terms of we can't even do a song live that we haven't recorded and not have people sort of instantly judge it on social media and on in YouTube comments. That's, and that's how Dial a Song started, right? It was just like I think it was your tape machine, just like it, and you just threw a cassette in there and just let people listen to it, right? Yeah, it was very it was very casual. Yeah. And actually, you know, I had this weird experience the other day um, where you know how like YouTube like suggest things for you to listen to. Yeah. And and the, I actually tripped over this this thing, you know, because I'm the like one of the administrators on the they might be giants YouTube channel. Yeah. Um I guess, you know, like it's very familiar to me to have like they might be giants videos recommend, you know, like oh. you'll like the music of they might be giants <laughs> cool. guy and 
guy and they might be giants. <laughs> but like, um, but what was weird is that they, it suggested this compilation of uh, what was a fan, like tape trading cassette that had gone around for many years before the internet called The Power of Dial Song. Mm-hmm. That's literally fo- recordings off the phone machine, off a, off a tel- you know, via telephone, oh, cool. of, all, of all the songs that were f- on, the, on the Dial Song. And it's an hour 46 long. Wow. And the, and most of these songs are like a minute and fifteen seconds long. Like there's a you know there's a demo version of Birdhouse and Your Soul on there mm-hmm. that I you know that I know that recording really well. But it's like all it is is a verse and a chorus and a little instrumental break, and that's you know and edu 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 you know that that <laughs> is essentially all there is on yeah. that recording. And I was listening to this thing, and I was like, wow, these are the most casual recordings. Like some of them. I, I mean, I can tell that some of them were literally made singing into the phone machine. <laughs> like we didn't use a, we didn't do a multi-track. Yeah. We just we just sang a song onto the cassette, and that's how it went out. And with a lot of things on, like the early days of Dial a Song, like we didn't even we just would, the next you know a couple of days later we would just erase that and make another. Gone. So it would just be gone forever. It would just be gone, yeah. So and this like one dude who recorded on his phone and threw it on YouTube is just the savior of that recording now. Exactly. Yeah. Well, and when I was listening to these songs, I mean, I was like, oh my God, you know, that's, that's not like such a bad song. You know, it's like, <laughs> like there are a million songs on this thing that I have barely any recollection of at all. Mm-hmm. Um, and, 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 you know, very scant documentation. And then some of them were like, oh, it's like, oh, I remember that. That was good. Like, why didn't we do something more with that? You know, it's just, it's such a, such an odd thing. But these days, you know, if we did something that, that was that casual, I feel like, I guess we would just feel too self-conscious if like the usual YouTube comment is like, these guys are losing it. Like, <laughs> you know, that, that there's no, there's no explaining a demo to people who are used to finished recording. Yeah. Like, and, and you don't want, you don't want to say like, no, great on a curve. You know, there's no, there's no, there's no, um, there's no uh, amnesty for kind of casually done stuff. So yeah, no, for sure. So, it's so just, basically, just so basically we just movies. just circling back to like we spent like a year and a half or a, you know sixteen months or something just writing and writing and writing and recording and and popping into the studio and popping out and you know me and John trading files and just kind of trying to pile up as many songs as we possibly can. Mm-hmm. And then from the best of that, we pulled the best of that pile, or, or the most complete part of that pile, we pulled all the songs that are on I Like Fun. And, um, and it made for a pretty interesting album. You know, it's like, a, it, 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 um, you know, in some ways, it's like a very much a product of the Trump era. So it's like, you know, kind of got this, like slightly nerve paranoid, mm-hmm. um, like you know things are are getting horribly bad kind of vibe about it. But beyond that, you know, it's, <laughs> it's uh, you know it's a it's a rocking record. Well, cool. Well, yeah, it's a great record. Uh, there's some killer tracks on there. I know we've played. Uh, I played Communists Have the Music the like week it came out, and I like listened to it once the time before, and then I played it on the radio, and then like in the studio, I was like really was really bopping with that. So it really stuck with me. Oh, excellent. Cool. So. Moving on, yeah, I heard you were before we got everything talk started. I know you were pouring a cup of coffee and more fun Holland, Michigan facts. It's actually a pretty bumping place for coffee roasters, surprisingly not. Oh, I believe it. So, I believe it. yeah, so the, we have like three coffee shops in town, and the like debate on campus that you have to like pledge your allegiance to one of them. Which is really yeah. <laughs> so you're either like a Lamangelo's guy or a Lemon Jello's guy. Uh, a J, not a JPs, Ferris guy or a 205 guy, and those are your three options. You got the sticker on your laptop, you got your mug, and you just have to like praise that one coffee shop and fight anyone else who disagrees with you. <laughs> Interesting. Well, you know, the, uh, in recent years, we've been um, we had a tour tour driver, tour bus driver, mm-hmm. who was a, who was a really unusual guy. He was a uh, he was a linguist, and he had, he was an academic, and he basically he spent a lot of his time translating Spanish into Portuguese and Portuguese into Spanish. Cool. Um, but he lived for a while. He lived in in Portugal, and he said 
What's surprising is that, like, well, I guess Spanish and Portuguese coffee are both, like, two American tastes, like, extremely bitter mm-hmm. and, and, like, very, like, raw. Like, they, they really, like, just make very strong espresso-based coffee. So he actually, he said he, like, kind of couldn't take it. Um, so, you know, even though, I mean, obviously, there's, you know, culturally, like, I'm sure there are people who are like, this is the greatest coffee in the world, but, yeah. you know, um, he was just like, I need, I need to, you know, have a, a more normal coffee experience. And he actually started roasting his own coffee, and it's not a hard thing to do. It's, it's really you know, not. It's, it's a lot closer to making popcorn than, than it is, like, when, I, when you hear coffee roasting, you think, like, oh, this is, like, something that has to happen in a factory, it's it's a, it's kind of like making popcorn. <laughs> it's so, pretty easy. Like a lot of people yeah. uh, that I know are like super. My brother's really big into like one of those like hydro pump jobs. You know what I'm talking about for coffee? No. Yeah, it's like it looks like just like a big old syringe where you like shoot hot water out of a filter into your coffee cup. It's <laughs> pretty well, interesting. Mean, well, like I mean, it's not like press coffee. It's kind of like that, I think. But. Huh. I mean, I, I, you know, the, John Linnell is really into press coffee. Okay. To me, it, 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 it seems like sort of cowboy coffee. It doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't taste particularly great to me. But, like, so is this, like, this isn't the one that sort of looks like it's in test tubes? Honestly, you might be right. <laughs> yeah. I got one for Christmas, and I've used it, like, once for my brother. Uh-huh, uh-huh. And, like, is it complicated? It's, I don't have really an access to hot water <laughs> so well. Oh. So, oh. like, using it is hard. Right, right. Yeah. But um, if people in town are also really big into, like, pour-overs. And it, comparing it to, like, a popcorn, making popcorn is super relatable. Yeah. Well, uh, the pour-over thing is good. That's, that's some, like, really high-quality coffee. Oh, yeah, sure. I love it. Cool. All right. So I'm, I'm happy that coffee culture is, uh, you know, has kind of taken off. Like, you know, because it was, like, the regular... You know, the alternative, you know, I mean, obviously, I think a lot of people hate Starbucks just because, well, for one thing, people always hate their first job, no yeah. matter what it is, no matter how good a job it is. So you're just going to hate, and I think a lot of people's first job is at Starbucks these days. So there's sort of no reason they wouldn't hate Starbucks. But, like, the world before Starbucks, which is a world that I was very familiar with, <laughs> there was so much, there was so much low-octane diner coffee that was so... Sad making, mm-hmm. like I'm, you know, I, I'll, I'll never, com- I'll never complain that we live in a post Starbucks reality. <laughs> it's okay. Yeah, it's okay. really pretty good. I was talking about my brother a second ago, and I wanted to bring up what what I've kind of hearkened as like a life of they might be giants. So I was, huh. I'm only 19 years old, so I was like born in like the prime time of this. My older brother is 32 right now. And he, uh-huh. like he threw me on to like no as a kid, and I just wow. heard him listening to like a bunch of other stuff. Like I remember like listening to Don't Let's Start when I was a kid, and just hearing like Spiraling Shape and other songs in the background as that when I was ahead as a kid. And it was kind of like just growing up with the band in the background, but not really like knowing it. Uh huh. And when I was a kid, I found a copy of Gigantic, your guys' movie. And, oh, right. Yeah, I threw it on and watched the whole thing and just, like, without really, like, knowing, like, what They Might Be Giants really is and just, like, watched it and I was like, wow, I know all of these songs, couldn't tell you the words, but I know all of these melodies. Oh, interesting. Yeah, and my older brother, when he was in college, he had, like, the William Allen White face everywhere, which really freaked me out. <laughs> <laughs> and it was awesome. So, like, just, like, what? how do you feel about, like... Especially with all the kids' music out now, how do you feel about like people like me? I guess like living a life of they might be giants. Well, you know, it's I, I, I think we're kind of we're kind of disassociated from it in, in a way. It's like you know we don't we don't um, do that many fan oriented things like where we actually interact with people. So, yeah. um, and I live a pretty isolated. You know, I I spend most of my time in in uh uh like a couple of hours north of New York City where it's it's a pretty quiet area mm-hmm. um i mean it, it it's a really quiet area <laughs> it's like the the population density here is like zero and 
Um, so, like, I, you know, it's, I think our lives are, are pretty uh, unaffected by, um, like, the work, the work that we do and, like, whatever notoriety we have. Um, I did have, speaking of no, I had this experience years ago. It was probably, a, like, five years after no had come out. Mm-hmm. And it was really at the beginning of, it was post, it was post Napster. Okay. But it was, but the, but like pre, like the, you know, like, I think like, you know, the iPod had sort of just come in, but people were still very much, you know, it was just like the era when people were burning CDs a ton. Oh, cool. Like, <laughs> like time. probably like 2007 or okay. something when like, you know, basically like, like there, there were still some record stores, there were still some bookstores, and there were tons and tons of people burning CDs. And um, we had we had guests come over, and um, like, like a friend of ours came over, and they brought a, a couple who were their friends, and they had kids. They didn't have their kids with them, but we were just like socializing and you know, having, like, you know, lunch or dinner. You know, we had we had dinner. We had dinner with them. We were talking, and, like, they were... I, I don't even remember... I don't even remember, what, like, what they did, but they were just, like, local people. And I never mentioned that, like, I was in a band. I never said anything about being in a band. Yeah. Which is, like, you know, fairly typical um, for me because it's just, like, you know, you don't want to kind of, like, have people you know, take, have that kind of take over the conversation. So we just talked about everything else about the area we're in and all sorts of things, mm-hmm. local politics and stuff. And, um, and we talked about them. Mm-hmm. And then, um, and as they were leave, but as they were leaving, I pulled out a copy of no on, on CD. And, and I said like, you no, know, if you, if, um, you know, I would love for you, your kid to have this album because, you know, uh, you know, I think it's, you know, I don't know. What, I don't know how I introduced it, but the, the the mom was like, "Oh no, that's okay. A friend of ours burned it for us. A couple, <laughs> you know, you know, like a month ago. We've, we've cool. got that. We've got that one." And I realized that, like, I had done such a totally casual job of keeping my my identity as a, a guy in They Might Be Giants <laughs> under wraps uh-huh. that she that she didn't realize like I was I was anything but just a person who had a copy of now. <laughs> it was just a genuine conversation about this one album by this one. Yeah, it's like, yeah, it's like, yeah, it's like, no, I don't need that. I, I got it burned. I burned that. It's cool. <laughs> well, cool. Uh, going off the whole family thing. So my older brother is also a huge Giants fan. And when I told him, hey, I get to, I get to talk to Flansburg, he was like, oh, my God, I have a few questions. Excellent. So his first question was, would you rather go bowling with Rod Stewart or Henry Rollins? Um, well, you know, I, I think, I think probably Rod Stewart. I think Rod Stewart's probably a friendlier guy in some ways. <laughs> yeah, 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 you might be right. It's hard, it's hard to know. Yeah. I mean. That's what bowling would do. Take him bowling, get to know a guy. I, I know, I, you know, a, a, I worked with this drummer named Steve Calhoun years ago who was on the D.C. like straight edge scene. Uh-huh. Or, you know, right, like, you know, way, way, way back in the day. Cool. And when Henry Rollins, before Henry Rollins, like, even was in, uh, what was, what, what band was he in? Black Flag. Like, uh, Black Flag. Yeah. <laughs> uh, before he was a singer, he he wasn't the original singer in Black Flag, which I, like, I'm not, I'm, I don't track Black Flag so closely, but so, like, um, I mean, it's kind of like ACDC, right? Like, there was, like, some guy who was the original singer in Black Flag uh-huh. or, like, a very important early interval. And then there's Henry Rollins, who was, like, the singer in Black Flag for the time that they were really yeah, famous. Yeah, when they were, like, Black Flag, Black Flag. Right, exactly. So, like, the you know, ACDC, to me, like, you know, Back in Black is, that's ACDC. Yeah. Like, you know. Um, but like for a lot of people, like Bon Scott is the only part of AC, ACDC that they like. But anyway, he knew uh, uh, Henry Rollins before he was, had used before he like lifted weights, mm-hmm. and he said it was like so weird to see him post weights and steroids because he was like 
completely unidentifiable dude. Like he completely mor- morphed into a different person. He looks like a superhero version of himself. Yeah, which is you know kind of kind of crazy. I, yeah, I mean, I don't know. I, I don't. I don't know. I don't really have a line on Henry Rollins. Like maybe he's a total gentleman. Maybe he's like an interesting guy to chat with. I think he's like if, doing like not like stand up comedy, but like stand up speech tours now. Well, he stopped per- performing music a long, long time ago. Yeah, and they they never. It's it's an interesting thing. Like he never made a public announcement about it. Um, he never said like I'm not playing. So-, you know, I'm not touring doing music but i don't think he's played a, a rock concert in 20 years and it's like he's he's still very famous like oh, you know yeah. it sort of goes to tell, tell show you how how long a tail like a career can have even if you're really not working actively at all for sure because he was like just like the face of punk rock for a little bit oh absolutely it's like wikipedia image number one <laughs> kind of dude yeah oh yeah right. but you know conversely rod stewart i you know i don't know if you're familiar with the band faces yeah um but the faces small faces and faces did some amazing stuff mm-hmm. and um i would highly recommend uh checking out this band this album by jeff beck called truth okay which uh, which uh Rod Stewart sings on, and you know it's sort of in that supergroup moment of music where a lot of bands were kind of moving out of the sixties and into the seventies. And mm-hmm. I think I think it's very possible that Keith Moon might play uncredited on this album. Oh. And they do like the most insane kind of post Hendrix infused version of the song. Uh, Shapes of Things, which was the Yardbirds' big hit single, yeah. but they do this sort of psychedelic version of it that is so nuts. And Rod, Rod Stewart is like, he's just a fantastic kind of frontman for like that kind of music. I, I, I think you know we, it's hard to sort of separate the 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 crud of Rod Stewart from the good part, but there actually was, you know, when he was just doing these. Kind of psychedelic blues songs. He's fantastic. Oh yeah, for sure. And the last question I have for my older brother is more of a Linnell oriented question, but he asked, "Will there ever be any more state songs?" I don't know. If you, you know, know the I, I, I that obviously should only be answered by John Linnell, but yeah. I have a sneaking <laughs> suspicion. No, and I don't know. I don't know exactly why. Uh-huh. Um, uh, you know, he's not. John's not. Uh, it's such an open ended project in a way. You could kind of. Do do almost anything you wanted, and then sort of fill it in as as state songs. And I think he's I think he kind of you know teased people into thinking that all, like all the states would end up getting represented. But yeah. um, I don't know. He's easily distracted. Uh, to tie it back to good old Hope College, are you familiar with Sufjan Stevens? I certainly am. Yeah, he went to college here for a little bit. Oh, really? So yeah, the whole states thing. He made Illinois, Michigan, and that whole deal. <laughs> And yeah, on on Michigan, there's a song called Holland, which is just super representative of the town here. Oh, really? So yeah, big big songs about states, guy. <laughs> but he but he you know he stopped after two. Yeah, he made he made Illinois, Michigan. He well, he said he was gonna do all fifty, and then he said no. <laughs> right. No, he actually works in the same studio complex. Like right down, he's right down the hall from where we recorded Whoa. <laughs> everything for the past year. Cool. He's got a, he's got a, he's got the corner room in the, uh, in the, in this floor of, uh, you know, Project Studios, and then there's the big studio, and uh, Pat Pat Dillett, the guy we work with, has like the the big room off the big studio, and that's, but uh, yeah, he's. Got, Sufjan Stevens has his own corner office. Cool. Do you think there's ever going to be like intermingling between the Giants and Sufjan? You know, I really just like rode the elevator down with him. I don't think he really <laughs> knows who we are. So <laughs> great. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, to tie it back to, I guess, more of a you solo oriented question: Will there ever be any new Monopuff stuff ever? <laughs> I would. I would love to do that. You know, um, Steve Calhoun, the drummer I was talking about, who is the who was. Did the who used to know uh, a, a, 
Skinner on steroids at Henry Rollins. Yeah. He was the dr- he was the drummer in Molotov. Yeah, he was a he was a great guy, and I loved I loved playing with him because he just had like a really really exuberant kind of style. Mm-hmm. He had played in a lot of. He's from Dent. He he went to that music place in Denton, and just he's something very very almost like New Orleans like about the way he played. Like he just plays very lively sort of unpredictable kind of drummer and it's just great and uh and Hal the bass player um you know he does a lot of commercial work now mm-hmm. and I don't I don't know I don't know you know I I I I don't know if I could afford them if to be perfectly honest <laughs> when was the okay the the rattle off that have you ever when was the last time you went on monopuff.org no <laughs> I haven't been on monopuff.org. I, I, I was, <laughs> I, I just, I found it on the Damn Happy Giants wiki and to click the link and it was last updated a solid, let's say it was last updated October 14th, 1998. There you go. So <laughs> let's it's, go internet. It's a real treasure of a place. Really? Oh, so, yeah. I mean, what is it exact? What is it? I'll pull it up. <laughs> Unlike the main site, it says like if you like, they might be giants and ween and bare naked ladies. You'll love Monopuff. Huh? <laughs> I wonder who put that together. I have no idea, but yeah, lack they last on October nineteenth, nineteen ninety eight. I totally recommend that. It's like it's a real just treasure at this point. Interesting. Yeah, the dot org thing is a weird parallel existence. Yeah. Yeah. You know. There's a lot of sort of like uninvited guests into uh, the conversation. Mm-hmm. And going going off, they might be giants wiki. How do you feel about just a website of just a history and backlog of everything you've ever touched musically? Well, the they might be giants wiki is an amazing resource. It's a you know, uh, it's a fan driven thing. Yeah. But it but um, because the front row of they might be giants is so. Um, uh, fact based there's a lot of um you know they do they do a lot of uh good uh research into like what actually happened when and like a lot of things get corrected yeah and um as a resource for us just as a touring band mm-hmm. to be able to uh go back and see what set set lists we put together last say like last time we played in London yeah. I can look I can see the show we did in London and if there's something some really big set piece in the show that we don't want to necessarily repeat it sort of saves us from accidentally doing the ever doing the same show yeah so um, it's just like and a that, good old that, open source things for even you you guys to use oh it, it's 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 invaluable for us because yeah. You know, we have a pretty big repertoire of songs, but we also end up leaning on a lot of, of the same songs, just because, you know, they're the they're the popular ones. But if you can figure out a way to sort of reshuffle the deck, like, like you know, if I'm putting together a set list and it's like in the middle of the show and it's like, okay, we need like a we need to sort of have a, a song that really rocks out and kind of brings this, you know, this part of the show to a crescendo, like Mm -hmm. what, you know, and John's just sung two songs. Like, so it's got to be like a song that I sing that's really up tempo. I'll be like, okay, well, should I do like Twistin' or like Cyclops Rock? And I'll look, I'll look on the wiki and I'll see, oh, well, last time we played in London, we played Cyclops Rock. So we should, you know, let's play, we'll play Twistin' tonight instead. And that way it won't seem like, and like, a simple thing like that can, you know, listen, I mean, do you know, we, we put a lot of effort in just, like, keeping the show fresh in every way. Like, we, you know, we introduce new old songs all the time. We introduce new songs all the time. And, like, I think anybody who's seen our show multiple times will realize, like, that it's like we, keep, we really make an effort to keep the ball rolling. But it's like, like, the, the, the great thing about the wiki is that it really – Whatever might be lacking can get like sort of double checked, yeah, and and sort of uh, it just it just keeps it, it just it, it it's like a a little additional kind of sleight of hand that we can put into the show that just makes it seem all the, all that much more uh, different. 
Oh yeah, have you ever, have you ever fact checked yourself using the wiki? I went. Uh, well, I, um, I usually just use it for like dates. Uh, you know, for like trying to figure out like when things happened. But um, uh, I don't. I don't. I don't need to rely on facts that much. <laughs> so, um, I mean, although you know, although I do, I do sometimes forget like what album certain songs are on because like in the you know in some some things were made kind of over a course of time like there were songs that were written you know in the John Hen you know before John Henry that ended up on factory showroom there were songs that were written on you know before the first album that yeah. ended up on flood like it's know, like, like there's, there's, there's you know there are things like that that kind of like constantly confuse us cuz um, spacesuit was written like stupid long ago before Apollo 18 right oh yeah i mean alienations for the rich was written before the band even started cool <laughs> so you know like like yeah there's there's a there's a lot of things that are just sort of out of left field in one way or another and you, you just i think people tend to you know just whatever something is album something's associated with is like what you think is the that's the deal but a lot of things have history longer than that yeah to go off the john henry route it's my personal favorite album but it was like the, the talk for a little bit, because it was the first Giants album with a full band. Yeah, yeah. and it was you guys received some like pretty serious backlash on that, didn't you? Well, you know what, you know what, that is. I, I think I can, I think I can set the record straight on. I can, I can fact check that for you. <laughs> okay. Basically, you know, like we started the band in nineteen in the nineteen eighty three. Yeah, which is like before drum machines really existed. Yeah, and we were working with, we were putting together. They're like sequencers existed, and people would like trigger sounds synth off of synthesizers, and like if you had like what would be called like a track show or an electronic act, you could do something, but it really wasn't drum machine based. And then over the course of like eighty four, eighty five, eighty six, like the drum machine technology really emerged, and that's like the beginning of hip hop and and like Run DMC and all yeah. those all the things like all the things that go. <laughs> <laughs> That all happened right as we were starting. They might be giants. Yeah, and so we had, we were a duo that worked with, we worked with um, a pre-recorded tape that was our rhythm section. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't at first. It wasn't actually a drum machine at all. It was basically sounds off. We created off a Moog synthesizer and then drum sounds that we recorded at our project studio. So we record real like live drums and then just play along to that. Yeah. So. Like the the band that was the format for the band for essentially ten years, mm -hmm. and then in like 1991, when like two things happened, which was like that had nothing. Or three things happened, and only one of them had anything really to do with us directly. Mm -hmm. We st we stopped playing clubs, which held 200 people, and started playing theaters that held like 2,000 people. Yeah. So the distance of the audience from us was really huge. So people couldn't really see necessarily see us as directly, and it kind of what was like a very charming cabaret kind of show mm -hmm. with that seemed very non-illusionistic suddenly turned into something much bigger, and we were nervous that the that the tape wasn't the the drum machine part of it didn't really scale yeah. in that traditional sense. Yeah. Then then you have the Milli Vanilli event <laughs> where all of a sudden like going from being like an electronic music act to being what would be perceived as like a tape act or like a you know like a track act yeah got really blurred and like so there's so there's this huge sort of negative you know down you know top spin on just working with any anything pre-recorded seemed like very phony. Like yeah. we 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 weren't really worried about whether it seemed phony to people or not. Like we just were like, these are our original songs. Like, are they not original enough for you? Like, <laughs> you know, we're doing something that's very much our own thing. But yeah, but all of a sudden, but you know, the culture around us was shifting. And then finally, you know, it was like the grunge moment, and everybody was like, 
you know, vo- the vo- stage volumes were changing radically. Mm. We were doing all sorts of festival shows with, you know, in front of huge audiences. And the whole rock culture was changing. So we thought, like, well, this would be an interesting time to, like, experiment and see, like, what it would be like to have a live act, mm-hmm. to, just, like, to just go with a live band. And the, the great thing was uh, it was, uh, you know, They Might Be Giants as a live act totally exploded yeah like it like like people loved our sh- like went from liking our show and thinking it was kind of interesting to loving our show and it was like people you know it was, everyone was dancing it was like an incredible celebration and really really super fun like yeah. it just it just was a very successful transition and the, and i don't think anybody had any complaints in terms of Except for people who wanted to hear me and John talk back and forth more, <laughs> which was kind of the, the thing that really did go out of the window. Uh-huh. I don't. Th- I don't think anybody minded. But what was what the big challenge was figuring out how to just do the kind of indefensible, fragile, sonic things we were doing with samples and MIDI programming and mm-hmm. all the kind of you know, what you would think of as, like, the more eccentric part of what we were doing yeah, kind of got, like, normalized by having a live band, like, trying to take a live band into the studio. Like, going going into a studio with a drummer and a bass player, people have very stock ways of working. Mm-hmm. You know, like, engineers and producers are like, we know how this works. Like, this is, this is how you record a good drum sound. This yeah. is how you record a good bass sound. Yeah. Like, when we would go into the studio as a duo with, like, a bunch of samples that we had made at home and, a, you know, a drum program that we had made at home, you know, the producers would be like, how do you want to do this? I have no <laughs> idea. I, I don't what even know this? what we're doing. I don't even know what this is supposed to sound like. Yeah. And so, you know, we went from making very original-sounding recordings to suddenly, like, making very regular-sounding albums. Mm-hmm. And I think it was... Um, so it wasn't ultimately it wasn't like a huge transition, yeah, but it took us a while to kind of get our to figure it out, but in the movie gigantic that you saw mm-hmm. there I think there's sort of like a bunch of fake drama <laughs> infused into this into this transit this transition was not bad this was oh, actually yeah. it was it was a it was a easy and ha- and generally celebrated transition, but in the edit of the movie it it sounds like there are people who are like walking out on our show and it, <laughs> i think i feel like it's kind of hypey yeah no it was just like it's just a change i guess because like it just went from just two dudes in a tape machine on a stage to this whole thing happening in front of you yeah i think the truth is also we were we were struggling with if if we were more if we were sharper or more consistent performers mm-hmm. um and we had, like, the confidence that, like, we were never going to be misunderstood as an act. I think we could have st- stuck with the duo format, and it would have worked. Mm-hmm. Because, because the truth is, it's like, there's, like, a comedy thing going on with what we're doing that I think is actually really personal and, and can be very ref- refreshing and, and cool. Mm-hmm. But the thing is, like, it's hard to... It's not. It's not like an act. Like we're not. We're not stand-up comedians who yeah. can like reproduce our performance night after night. Like if we're just like totally, you know, dragged out from being on the road for you know six shows in a row. Like we just played the songs, and yeah. and like we might not be like super cheerful between <laughs> the. You know, like that's the thing that's sort of different about being in this band rather than being in like a like a you know, a theater show or yeah. like a comedy act or something that's like there's a script or there's like a, a strategy. Mm-hmm. There's no there's no there's no strategy for a being like cheerful. Like we actually we can actually do a pretty good job of being super grumpy at yeah. times. So that's like that's that's like my favorite thing about the band that's really hard to explain to other people. So I I can show people giants and be like are they just a, like a comedy group? Because like they'll hear songs right. like "The Day" or something, and right. it's just like no, like their lyrics actually mean something. It's just like mm-hmm. listening to that and just knowing that like they're just dudes who like to have fun and have fun in their music sometimes. 
Yeah, well, that's, I mean, that's, that's very kind thing to say. I mean, it 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 is like it's it's um, it's a weird balancing act, and it is it is kind of its own. It's just kind of a self defined act, and it does have a humorous aspect to it that makes it kind of a little bit lumpy compared to uh, you know most things that are either like you know very self serious or yeah. clearly or clearly for laughs. Yeah, I, mean, I think I think the truth is like. We just wanted to figure out how to make music that would like stand up to. We wanted to, to like you know have our sensibility, but but also hold up to repeated listening. Yeah, and I and you know that's that in and of itself. Like anytime you you incorporate humor into something, it's in a way you're kind of invite you're sort of almost putting a sell by date on it. Like you can't you don't want to listen to a comedy record like a hundred times. Yeah. That's like that's well that's the thing about giant. It's not like it's not like oh there's the one joke in that one song. It, no, it's just like it's just it's such a unique and ornate thing that I haven't heard in any other band that makes me just love the band even more. Well, that's very that's extremely kind. kind thing <laughs> I love say. your band, dude. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate that. <laughs> well, I you know I I I enjoy the MFB Giants too. Hey, me me it's as been, well. Uh, <laughs> it's been a manic episode. You know, like the weird thing. You know, we've been doing this for 30 years now, and, and, like, inevitably people are like, how can you be in a band for 30 years? Like, people aren't even in bands for, like, five years. And mm. to me, like, the whole thing, my whole life has, like, gone by in, like, five seconds. Yeah. It's, you know, it's just, it's been such a, it's really been a blast. Yeah. I guess that just, like, I guess you can throw, like, the, oh, the time flies when you're having fun. Thing, uh, like, yeah, well, I mean, it, it, it's, it's, you know, it, it, it's a testament to uh, having fun, that's for sure. Yeah. Um, okay, to wrap things up, because we're hitting almost the hour mark. Here. Holy smokes! Yeah, right. <laughs> I wanted to ask you what you've been listening to as of recently. Well, uh, let me see if my computer is still charged, <laughs> because that will be a, the easiest way for me to recall. Yeah. Speaking, speaking of fact-checking oneself. <laughs> um, I wanted, sometimes, sometimes, I'm, sometimes I go to the the iTunes most played thing, but I'll just, I think I can, I think it's in Spotify. There's a, there's a thing that's like, like, like most recent songs you added. Oh yeah. Like library. Yes. Yeah, so uh, library, is it called library? No, it's called song. Here, songs. This is the songs I've clicked on. Cool. <laughs> um, well this morning I just added, uh, <coughs> excuse me, a song by this woman, um, Gabby Garbutt, who is a British singer, who's she's collaborating with. This is a, this is a blast from the past. Uh, the the front man from Dexys Midnight Runners, the hey. guy who did <laughs> Come On Eileen, who people probably don't know anything else by the Dexys Midnight Runners, but he was a really interesting and talented guy cool. back in the day. And I guess he's a he's a he's a uh, producer now. And he but this song. Uh, Lady Matador is like it really sounds like Dexys Midnight Runners in the original. They were like a post ska. Come on, Eileen is like a weird one because everybody's heard it too much. But like, yeah. he, but he did some cool stuff. Um, uh, here's a song I just listened to called "My My Darling New Orleans" by Little Queenie and the Percolators. That's just like a New Orleans song. Um, I was listening to the Keith Richards book on tape. <laughs> Which is a cool. really strange, really <laughs> strange book. Yeah. Um, Honestly, okay. And, random, random thought that just came into my head. Yeah. I think like three years ago, you tweeted something about the lounge lizards, and I wanted to thank you for turning me on to the lounge lizards because they're awesome. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, John Lurie is a very John Lurie actually works with our engineer Pat Tillett. Cool. Um, and he's a really interesting guy. He's he's become a very uh, successful painter in New York City, like like fine art painter. So he's cool. had a whole second act, which is kind of crazy. Um, but let's see. Uh, um, here's a song called "Do Your Thing" by a, a, an artist named Moondog. Who oh, there's, yeah. a docu- there's a documentary about him that's pretty interesting. I to um, his live albums that sounded amazing. I yeah, it was like him you know what's Berlin. funny is John Zorn was very John Zorn actually. Backed up Moondog Whoa. in Moondog's band. Cool. <laughs> that was like that was like the first like professional gig he had in New York City as a young man. 
Uh, let's see, we've got Casey and the Sunshine Band. we got I'm Bored by Iggy Pop from one of his mid-70s, late-70s albums. Yeah. And here's, Matt, here's Matt's Seduction by St. Vincent. Oh, yeah. Um, oh, uh, here's a song. Do you know the band The Raining Sound? I don't know anything about them. I don't. But they have this song called Never Coming Home that is a, a beautiful song. Okay. Um, I recently was listening to uh, this woman named P.P. Arnold. Speaking of Rod Stewart, she was she went out with Steve Marriott from The Faces, and she like uh, she did like the first version of the first cut is the deepest. The original her version of first cut is the deepest is like this amazing kind of soul. Uh, it's, it's hard to even describe, but it's it's just like it's it's much much better than the Rod Stewart version of First Cut of the Deepest. Um, let okay, let's see. Um, here's a song by War on Drugs. Oh, this is a great song. This, have you heard J D. McPherson? I have you know not. Who he is? I don't. I don't. I think he's from like the Midwest somewhere. Cool. But he's he's he does this sort of like retro. He he almost sounds it, it sounds like it's from another time. It sounds like it's from the sixties. He has a song called Northside Gal that is like totally killer. Cool. Um Yeah, that's you know, that's that's the that's my top twenty of the week. All right. You know. A lot of things I don't know particularly like you know I, I spend a lot of time listening to a lot of the same stuff, but oh, this, yeah. uh, but this is all the the new stuff. Well cool. Well all right. Yeah. That kinda that kinda wraps up our recording time here. All right. Well, awesome, man. Well, thank you for the interest, and thanks for uh, being part of the uh, radio network. And uh, Oh, yeah. Thank you and, for your uh, support of college radio, for real. Oh, Independent yeah. radio. Yeah. Community radio. It's the best. Well, cool. Thank you. Uh, this has been Phonos here on WTHS 89.9. I'm Jack. Jack. Yep. That's your boy. <laughs> and I've been thank you. talking with uh, John Flansburg from They Might Be Giants. All right. Cool. Talk to you later. Yep. I'll see you around. Right. Okay. Bye.